Welcome back, everyone. This is another episode of Trek Wars at OSU. That's Oregon State University. My name is uh, Joseph Orozco. I'm a professor of philosophy at Oregon State University. And I'm also the co-director of the Inares Project for Alternative Futures. The Inares Project is a forum for conversations, uh, initiatives, and projects that try to envision a future free of exploitation, domination, war, and empire. And today we have a very special conversation about indigenous futurism. November is typically Native Heritage Month and I've invited a very special guest to talk with us a little bit about his artistic vision. My guest today is Ryan Singer, who is a Diné Navajo artist who blends his appreciation of traditional native culture with Star Wars. And that's why we've invited him to talk today uh, uh, with us. Um, Navo, uh, uh, Ryan grew up on the Navajo Nation. He is Diné Navajo. Uh, he's won numerous awards, uh, including uh, awards from the Santa Fe Indian Market and the uh, Heard Museum Indian Market. As well, he's been a cover artist for the Phoenix New Times, the Native Peoples Magazine. And his work can be found at uh, numerous galleries throughout the Southwest, including the Heard Museum in Phoenix and the Navajo Nation Museum in Window Rock, Arizona. So I wanted to invite him today to talk to us a little bit about his work and how he blends his appreciation of traditional native culture with a particular kind of vision of Star Wars. So welcome, Ryan. I'm glad that you're here with us today. Hello, how you doing? Good, thanks. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm really happy that you can be with us to sort of talk a little bit about the work you do. I've always been an admirer of your work. I own uh, some of your paintings. Uh, and a few years ago, we had you come to Oregon State when we were doing our 50th anniversary of Star Trek, which I know is not one of your, your, your areas that you do a lot of work in. Uh, I know Star Wars is your bag, but we appreciated you coming to talk to us a little bit about your work uh, with, uh, uh, with Star Wars. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this uh, with this project that we do in which we're talking about how uh, the major sort of science fiction franchises of Star Trek and Star Wars help us to think about our world and perhaps help us to envision our future. And so your work is really unique in this way because you blend you know, your awareness, your appreciation of your native heritage with your love of Star Wars. So I always ask guests when we start these conversations is uh, you know, give us a little bit of a sense of your appreciation of, uh, uh, of, of the science fiction uh, world that you love. So how did you first get interested in Star Wars? Well, um, I was born in 1973 um, up in Utah, Cedar City, Utah. And uh, my parents were both going to school uh, my parents were both going to school up there in uh, Southern Utah State University. And, um, you know, my dad graduated and he got a teaching degree. So he ended up down in mini farms. So this was about 77, uh, 76, 77. And um, I must have been about three kindergarten, preschool. And I was already drawing at this point. And, um, and I remember my sister, my sister is five years older than me. And uh, she was born in 69. And, you know, there's always this sibling rivalry, just kind of like this love, uh, dislike <laughs> um, relationship. And, um, you know, like if I if my sister was going somewhere, my I would be like, can I go with you? Can I go with you? And I would always bug my mom and she would have to my sister would have to take me. So she would always have like this, you know, like, oh, Ryan. And um, so what she used to do. But, I mean, my sister's cool and everything, but she used to she used to um, always have me watch like sci-fi uh, sci-fi movies every like Saturday morning. We would be watching Godzilla, King Kong, um, you know, all these different you know black and white uh, um, sci-fi classics. You know, like the Triantula, the giant uh, um, ants you know, the blob, all these different things would be coming on and we'd watch them, you know, pretty much after the uh, Saturday morning cartoons. And um, so that was kind of a thing my sister really got me into, you know, of course there was Star Trek. My sister would watch Star Trek all the time. And this was way before, um, I guess maybe I started, I seen Star Wars. And um, at some point um, Star Wars uh, came out, my uh, school, um, 
took a, a field trip down to Phoenix from many farms. And um, I must have been like, um, I can't remember, kindergarten or first grade. And um, I remember watching it and it just blew my mind. It just felt like I, it, it felt like I was, it was deja vu. Like I felt like I was experiencing deja vu for the first time. And it felt like this is what, um, this was, I felt almost real to me because it was the first time I seen uh, like a Star Wars or a, a, a sci-fi movie that had like its, you know, like the, the, you know, like it's robots or droids where they're all banged up and scarred up and like, you know, like there's sand all over the place. And um, even like the uh, land speeders all banged up, all these different things that just seemed like they were more real. They paid attention when they made this movie to how real they wanted to make it or authentic it was, or even how old it might've been. So just watching it, it didn't seem like it was way in the future. It could have even been like way in the past. So it was kind of, uh, it was, it really like got my, uh, you know, my brain thinking about like, wow, I've never seen a movie or a sci-fi movie that had this kind of, uh, you know, like this paid attention to this, uh, the detail so well, like even the spaceships were kind of like that. They were all banged up. And uh, I remember watching the uh, like older uh, sci-fi movies and all the star, um, the uh, everything was all sleek and clean and everything, you know, like it, it kind of almost seemed like it was too, not, not, it was almost fake, you know, like it wasn't real, wasn't real enough, you know, like it wasn't worn enough. And um, so that was kind of one thing that I picked up on was just like that realism. So it felt like this was real to me. So um, I, you know, at some point I'm buying the toys, playing with the kids in the neighborhood every Saturday, you know, with all our like Star Wars toys. And then my imagination going because, you know, we're discussing all the characters from the movies. And then obviously when Bubba Fett came in, by that time I'm drawing like the Millennium Falcon, TIE Fighters, you know, the whole scene on, you know, the frozen planet Hulk, uh, um, you know, like doing all these like uh, battle scenes and stuff like that, the at walkers and stormtroopers. I'm drawing all this stuff, um, you know, as a kid I'm doing this in um, grade school, you know, I'm selling them, I'm selling them to my friends, you know, you know, while this is happening, uh, I'm listening to music, uh, listening to heavy metal music because all my, uh, my older cousins and my uncles were all into metal. Um, and it was kind of like a thing, you know, people were in the Black Sabbath, Kiss, Led Zeppelin, Van Halen, Iron Maiden, all that kind of influenced uh, who I was, you know, and, you know, that was kind of like my um, surroundings. That was, you know, what was available. So that was kind of like, a, it's like, I, I started to listen to it, started to like it. I was like, man, this is cool. So by then, you know, by the time I'm like seventh grade, I'm like this metalhead drawing on um, Metallica and all these, you know, different bands and stuff. And then um, I went to Utah and, um, and I was really into metal, you know, like Metallica and, you know, Megadeth, Iron Maiden. And then um, I met up with these skater kids that were all into metal too. Like they were all into, uh, Metallica, Anthrax, and then they were into like COC, Corrosion of Conformity, Suicidal Tendencies. So I was like, oh, wow, I never heard of these bands. Let me check them out. And it was, you know, it was like metal, but it was also sort of punk. And it was like this crossover of punk and, and metal at that time where they would, where punk uh, guys would listen to this kind of metal and metal guys would listen to this kind of punk. So it was kind of like this crossover. And then I found um, Pusshead, the guy that did a lot of uh, Metallica's artwork. So then I'm drawing his artwork. Then I'm finding Thrasher magazine and all these different um, graphic um, illustrations by different artists that are starting to fuel um, kind of like the, um, the ideas in my head about art, you know? At this point, I had already been drawing like, you know, Star Wars and um, comic books and stuff like that um, and horror and sci-fi imagery. I was doing all that stuff before, but all of a sudden this music stuff started to change my um, trajectory of what art was supposed to be. Then I started to go to um, like libraries. This was like pre-internet, um, like in the late 80s. You know? <laughs> You know, you didn't, you didn't, if you wanted to find something, you had to go to the library. Right, right. 
I'd go to the library and look up art books, look up Salvador Dali books and sit there and look through them for hours and read them, find out that, you know, find out, read the biography, read about their lives, about the artist's lives and stuff like that. And that was really interesting to me. It's like, wow, this is so cool. And I, I found a lot of parallels with a lot of artists, their upbringing and um, how they started and all their like different things they did through their through their lives I started to see a lot of similarities that was you know like I could kind of relate with and mm -hmm. then uh, then at this point um, you know I started to it's I started to incorporate all these few like all these uh, influences and fuse them all together and I started my own artwork was like comic book styled mm -hmm. um, stuff that I was going through and then um, like um, some of the music influence and then just kind of like make this crazy um, um, surreal kind of uh, comic book looking black and white drawings. That was just like really strange looking. And I did that for years. <clears throat> and um, so I would meet up with all the kinds of uh, um, weird people, you know, like artistic people, weird people um, that were into the same stuff, you know. And um, I did that for, for years, you know. And, uh, and then later on, I got into uh, like, after I graduated high school, I found that Juxtapose magazine, like in the early 90s. And I was like, oh, my God, it's like I it look, it was like I found my own Bible. You know what I mean? It was like the Bible that was made, meant for me. It's like I picked it up and it's like, this is it. This is Robert Williams. You know what I mean? All these <clears throat> all these artists that were that that genre, that lowbrow art that was coming out, pop surrealism. That yeah, was, yeah what I was looking for, for, you know, my whole life, you know what I mean? It was there and it was like, it was in a magazine. I'm like, holy shit, these guys are making what I was kind of like, kind of coming, you know, my, everything that I was coming to as an artist, this was what they were doing. This is, a, they're doing it already. Yeah. So, um, and I show my friends, I was like, dude, check this out. I'm so excited. Nobody gave a, cr no, none of my friends gave a crap, you know, like, like so well, I don't care. But, yeah, this looks weird, whatever. I don't care. So, yeah. uh, come on man is so you know that so you know I, I kept my friends but um you know but i did kind of my own thing you know on the side you know every time i go somewhere and hang out with my friends i'm carrying around a sketchbook you know whatever wherever we did whatever wherever we went i'm walking around the sketchbook and i'm starting to paint at this point um um doing doing my own paintings but i don't have any kind of education or direction on how to do the paintings. I'm just kind of figuring it out. So, um, so I'm in taking, um, you know, forestry, I'm going into forestry at this point. I work with the forest service for three years. I'm still drawing and still kind of doing this kind of artwork. And, and I turn those kind of uh, ideas or that style into paintings, but it's not working. It takes me a long time to kind of like, mm how to make it happen and i'm still following all these other artists at the same time and um so then i'm starting to meet other artists kind of like in the community of artists they kind of like into the same thing i'm into you know i'm still friends with too to this day and um eventually i go back to school go go to asu and um all this time i'm having all these different jobs you know you know just to survive you know to wherever i live and um and, and then I end up going to school. I learn about, um, you know, like art, you know, art history. I'm taking all these drawing classes, painting. I'm taking design, color theory. Um, and um, I'm starting to start, it's everything in my brain is starting to, uh, it's starting to like click into place. Um, this must have been like uh, maybe early 2000. And uh, it just, everything just opened up like a floodgate. Like it just poured out. Like I, like, it just the creativity all the knowledge all the inspiration it just poured out of me like just came out like like nothing before and that's when that wagon burner came out right. uh, the um the image of the 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 button stew the andy warhol um yeah yeah you can that came out all these different um styles and um ideas and uh themes were all coming out at the same time and some of them dealt with racism some of them dealt with stereotypes some of them were personal uh some of them dealt with history native american history some of them dealt with alcoholism mm. all these different things that were um 
that were relating to me that I needed to sort of get out, you know, that were, um, you know, catharsis for me to get out and artwork to sort of tell my own story. You know, that's kind of what, that was kind of like a, to open up the bottle, you know what I mean? And to shoot the bottle and open it up and start letting things out. And then well, yeah, that's something I want to ask you about because so I mean, you know, um, you know, it's 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 interesting to hear like the sort of trajectory of your of your artistic style, grounded, you know, not only in sci-fi but in punk metal and this and you know your style is very distinctive in art. Uh, with this kind of like bold pop surrealism, uh, you know, very sort of uh, uh, dark outlining and comic book form. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, something that's like a pervasive theme throughout a lot of your work is, right, science fiction and particularly Star Wars. And so I'm kind of curious what you were just saying that, you know, that you found you got to a place where you wanted to, you, you needed to get things out, you needed to sort of uh, express your creativity. Uh, and, you know, for many years now, your work has been uh, attempting to try to express uh, Diné, uh, Navajo culture through depictions of science fiction, but particularly in, in Star Wars. So, so what is it about, or, you know, why did you decide that you wanted to explore Navajo Diné life through Star Wars in particular? What, what is it? What's the connection that you see? I mean, one thing that was interesting, as you were saying, is uh, I picked up is that Star Wars, you had these kinds of depictions of, of life in a, a desert sort of way. I, I wonder whether those kinds of settings resonated with you in thinking about growing up uh, where you did in the Southwest. But what are other sort of ways in which Star Trek or I'm sorry, Star Wars was a place for you to be able to get things off your chest? Well, after all this kind of stuff happened, you know, like when I was going to school at ASU, and all these classes kind of helped me uh, let the floodgates out. And I kind of like got those paintings out, you know, like the um, the Land of Fakes, you know, the Mutton Stew, the Wagon Burner. There was tons of them that just kind of came out. That's kind of like led the floodgates out for me and kind of released something that hadn't been done before. And it gave me an opportunity to kind of step back and realize what I needed to really do. And eventually I did a, um, the first one I did of that kind of like, was kind of like the beginning part of this whole series of Star Wars art was, um, I did, I always thought of uh, sand people as kind of nomadic um, tribal guys, you know? So they kind of reminded me of Navajos, you know, Navajos have always sort of been nomadic, um, you know, like raiders or, you know, kind of like living on their own off in the desert kind of, they were kind of real similar. And even as a kid growing up in, um, in Tuba City or in the, in the Navajo Reservation, I always, um, it always came back to me the first movie, uh, A New Hope, uh, when they're on Tatooine, you know, like when there's the Jawas and there's sand people, it looked just like Tuba City, right where my, my grandma's sheep camp was, you know, so I'd be out there playing with the toys that I got from Kmart, you know, for like $2, I'm up there playing, I'm like looking at this Arroyo, it looks just like that, that Arroyo that, uh, or that little spot that um, C-3PO and R2-D2 met up with those uh, Jawas. So it's like, it all made, it started to kind of make sense. I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to do like this uh, uh, sand, uh, Tuscan Raider, you know, holding up the Bantha stick uh, and he's got a Navajo war blanket. And then he's got like us in the background. It's like a sort of like a desert Navajo scene. It's, it's either Tatooine or the Navajo reservation. And then there's a Hogan back there. And then there's a little place where he has his coffee pot brewing. You know what I mean? And he's like standing there and that was the first one. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. So that was like this, um, so it was kind of like this energy that was evolving out of those kind of pieces where it kind of like, it made sense to me growing up on the Navajo reservation, remember play, remembering playing with those toys at my grandma's sheep camp, it started to make sense. Like it was, this is something that I could probably maybe do a little series on, you know, and come back to so then i was like all right this is cool i'll do this and then do that so i was kind of experimenting with things along the way and then it always then then people kept saying oh yeah princess leia's uh her the buns on her hair are real similar to the hopi hopi uh you know women uh the hopi maidens and um i remember reading something about um um 
George Lucas um, um, sort of taking us that haircut from, you know, from from many uh, places that culture and the Hopi was one of them. So as right, like, right. Totally, I remember that. It's totally it totally makes sense. It's and um, so then um, I'm starting to like come up with ideas for paintings. And the thing about trying to come up with ideas for paintings is it's it's not supposed to be like you're sitting here trying to come up with something it's supposed to, to me it's supposed to be like something that comes to you you know what i mean it's not supposed to be like i'm going to do this and i'm going to do that it's supposed to like be able to manifest in you somewhere or come from somewhere and it gets inside of you almost like a it's almost like a spirit you know like a spirit almost ident uh, entity or an idea you know that enters you and then you 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 kind of have to take care of it until it becomes something so um so then these started to come about you know and um so then i can't remember which ones i did after that i know i did the princess leia a couple times then after that i started to realize i i started to become more nostalgic you know for uh, for the res, you know, after living in Albuquerque for so long, I became nostalgic for going home, for the food, just being at home, just being a, around my people, just that comfort, welcoming feeling, and just being in the four corners where where my um, where where my um, nation is, you know. And um, it's not the same living in Albuquerque, you know, for me. It's like when I go home, once I pass that threshold of grants and then I get into Gallup, you know, I can feel it, you know, I can feel it in my body. I can feel it in my heart. It's, it's where I'm supposed to be. That's where I belong. So it's, uh, so those paintings are kind of nostalgic pieces for, um, for my homeland. So they're sort of like childhood memories of me being, you know, on the reservation, growing up on the reservation, remembering those scenes, remembering the open land, remembering remembering the rock formations, uh, the empty skies, the blue skies, the clouds, um, the plants, the vegetation, the sheep, uh, the smells, all these different things that associate, I associate with that, you know, that upbringing, that childhood. And then, uh, then the toys are part of the, um, the uh, landscape. They become part of my, my, um, you know, how my life, you know, was, you know, growing up on the reservation. So they're starting to interact with the uh, Navajo people in my, in my, in my um, paintings, in my stories. So it becomes like this whole thing um, in my, in my head, you know, so then I start telling these stories and it's like, I remember going to like a squad dance, you know what I mean? Like this, this is where, uh, where they'd go out in the middle of nowhere, they'd have a fire and they'd have a big old dance and um, they would they would all circle around and people would go there and I don't know if you're familiar with that but um so then um you know I had one where you know there were some of them would come in on horses and I made a painting where they all came in on tauntauns you know but it was a Navajo you know a whole Navajo scene you know so that's kind of like you know I started integrating these uh memories I had with as a kid with all these um Navajo or with all these Star Wars kind of imagery or characters and how they can interact. And, um, and those kind of like come to me at some point, you know what I mean? You know, like with the Shasta drinks, you know, with the, um, the spam and uh, the little uh, food, little food uh, vendor stands, all these things kind of like come to me, you know, at some point, I just, you know, the idea will pop in my head and then I'll just, you know, like I need to write this down, you know? So I'll write it down, sketch it out, or um, if I don't have anything on me, I'll like text myself on my phone the the the, um, the idea so I don't forget. Um, so um, that way I can come up do the painting later on, you know. So that's how that stuff comes about. And um, and I was I was I was I was talking about the um, ideas of entities and stuff like that. Um, there's times when I feel like when I'm painting. I don't know, this kind of has anything to do with this or either this or that, but it feels like um, um, I become disconnected um, with the world and um, I'm not here, I'm here physically, but I'm not here, um, I'm somewhere else and I'm painting. So they call that like kind of getting into the zone or experiencing, um, 
you know, or like the muse, you know, that's a part of you or whatever that follows. Yeah. yeah. That, that becomes like a whole spiritual kind of experience huh. for me. And I've spoken with uh, several painters about this experience. And I thought maybe I was the only one like that. I really, I kind of freaked me out the first time I kind of experienced it because it's kind of like, it's, you know, like a weird experience. Yeah. And um, I was just like, hey, do you, have you ever done this? Or is this something that happens? And he goes, yeah, that happens, but it doesn't happen all the time. And you can't force it too. Mm. So it's kind of like something that I've learned to accept, you know, like right. you know, respect it, you know, like respect that time or respect if it doesn't happen. And when it does kind of just let it, you know, let it, let it kind of take over and kind of just, you know, give that trust into that thing that's happening, you know, and it's, you know, it's what, what they call the zone. In right, right, right. Because um, you come, you become unaware of everything around you. You're so focused on this, you, what you're creating, that there's something working through you, almost right. a spiritual experience. And you're like the vessel, you know, you're like the, the thing that's making it, that's the physical part, you know, of making this, um, piece of work so it's kind of a cool, cool cool thing to be part of and i'm sure musicians i'm sure um singers people in the arts that that kind of touch on these things you know like on stage or when they're doing mm -hmm. something they can feel that you know that's that feeling that euphoria or something that's right that open. flow yeah that's that's you know i'm sure that's the same thing you know so um, it's a really cool experience to to do that. And well, so I have a question about you know the way in which you express uh, uh, you know your your background through your work in this kind of way, and you've been talking about like how for you this was a way of bringing together a lot of your memories into one kind of visual imaginative space. Um, I, I wonder uh, what's been the reaction of uh navajo dene folk to your representation of, of 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 your culture in this way um because it is a unique sort of way of, of thinking about right there's a lot of sort of traditional native art out there that tries to be very realistic about what different native lives might be about but here you're talking about expressing native life in this kind of fantastical futuristic kind of way what, what's been the reaction uh, amongst folks in uh, amongst uh, Navajo folk, for instance, about the way that you do this? Um, I've had pretty much nothing but positive feedback. You know what I mean? Um, especially with uh, younger um, people, you know, younger people than myself, um, you know, like 20s and 30s kind of uh, people, they... Um, they really like the uh, fresh, refreshing idea, you know, of native art. They, they see a whole indigenous art, this new way of kind of portraying, you know, a Diné life or Diné culture in a different way. And um, they, they really appreciate it. Plus, um, a lot of them are into Star Wars, you know what I mean? This has been a whole resurgence of Star Wars fans, you know, since the... Uh, the, after the prequels, you know, they started up with uh, Force Awakens, Rogue One, um, all these other movies, now The Mandalorian. And it's just like, there's, I mean, I got a nephew that's like, um, um, you know, like five or six years old. He loves The Mandalorian. And then my son, he's like 16, 17, actually 17. And he's like, he's into The Mandalorian. He loves that whole, you know, the whole thing, you know, the whole mystique and Boba Fett the man you know all that that stuff that's happening in the series you know that we're all into it so this says uh cross like generational you know like um generations of people you know where we can all kind of uh you know get together or connect on this level and then it's cool if you can add in uh the their life somehow you know because that's kind of who we are and um incorporate it somehow and uh, you know mix them together blend them together and uh, and if you can find something really cool to say about it like if there's a certain message and that's like the hardest thing to do is trying to come up with that 
that little thing that make it that makes it something to say you know like uh, like the yoda one with the uh with the uh that was inside the cradle board you know what i mean that that one you know i mean that like it's like you have to come up with the idea it's like where does that come from you know what i mean it's like perfect it's like why why wouldn't somebody do that you know what i mean and um i did i was like that when that movie came out last year or that series came out last year after um little the child was a hit you know the little baby yoda was a hit i kept saying dang i need to put that guy in a little um um little um what do you call it cradle board you know what i mean and I, it kept bugging me because i kept walking around and talking about it forever and then i finally got around to doing it near christmas and then after that it just exploded like it just went everywhere and all different indigenous people um, different tribes were doing the same thing and it was all over before we know it um what do you call it nbc's writing a paper on indigenous futurisms and how native americans had already adopted baby yoda you know as indigenous right i remember that i remember that whole thing about it is i thought wow this is so cool so i think that if you can find those right message to messages to say these uh, little things that make sense and that's the hardest thing that you, that's that's the hardest thing to do is find those and like i was saying before they have to come to you sometimes you know they mm -hmm. have to be you have to be at the right place at the right time for that thing to come into you, to come inside of you, that spirit or whatever, the idea. And um, I believe there's like spirits everywhere and things happening that we can't see, that we can't comprehend. So we have to just believe, you know, we just have to believe in who we are and believe that things will work out the way they're supposed to work out. So sometimes, I mean, some people will can receive those gifts or whatever, or these different things. And so you just have to trust in those things to be able to, when, whenever they, they need to come to you, or whatever they will. So it's kind of a, one of those things where you just kind of have to let it happen. You can't force it. So um, those ideas are like the things, you know, those are the, that's right. the, key, you know, and if you can pull it off, you know, then that's a whole other part of the whole trick, you know, if you can make it look good, make, you know, that's, that's when the art technique comes in, you know, you know, all the school schooling of art, um shading composition color um proportion all that stuff that balance um all that stuff becomes part of that everything you've learned in school so if you can get the idea and then you you can that's like the whole another next step um, well you've been even we've been talking a lot about your art uh so um you've been gracious enough to share uh, a couple of paintings for us to take a look at. Why don't we take a look at some of the, uh, the paintings that you've decided to share with us and, and tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, what your vision is here. What, what do you think is being spoken about in the, in the particular painting? So um, let me put up a, an image of, of, of one of your paintings uh, here. Um, uh, what do you call this one? Um, this one's called Sand People or Sand People Paint, Sand Painting. But well, I believe that's three words. Sand people, sand painting is um, one word. And so tell us what's going on in here. Like, what's the, what's the, what was, what was speaking to you here when you decided to do this? Well, my, uh, me and my wife were driving up to, uh, to Santa Fe one day, you know, and we're always talking um, about stuff. And, um, and I don't know if we were talking about my art or whatever, but somehow Star Wars became a thing. Um, in the conversation, then Sam people, and then I think one of us misspoke Sam people for sand painting or something like that. Like it was a kind of a, a mistake Then my wife goes, hey, you should do a sand people, sand painting, you know, get it, you know? And I was like, oh, cool. That's, that sounds like a good idea. So um, yeah, so that's how this idea came about. I think it basically came out of my wife's mouth. And then um, I took, you know, took the idea and then it you know kind of created it together what's cool about this uh this painting is um i always remember being in my grandma's home and they always have like a gun rack in the back they had a big old gun rack in the hogan and they'd have like their rifles up there and stuff like that and they'd always have like this tapestry that was like from the 60s or 70s like probably like late 60s early 70s like tapestry that was like this black kind of uh 
light brown kind of, you know, like with a big old eagle or like a bear, um, like this uh, nature scenery, you know, with mountains or something. And and it wasn't just my grandma's house, it was other, other people's houses. So it was kind of like a constant theme. And then there's the coffee, the Folgers can of coffee. And you realize that um, a lot of these uh, indigenous tribes, um, Navajos will use the coffee can for other things. I mean, once they use the coffee all in, in, in it's an empty thing, they use it as a container, you know, to carry things or put things in, they'll have another purpose for it. Um, so they'll, you'll see them just around, you know, for whatever purpose, whatever purpose they can use it for. Um, I, I know the, the Folgers can that you have there, that's a, that's a theme in a lot of your different paintings, right? Like this. So that's, you know, so you would say that that's one of those things that you're, t that you say sort of like is an ever present kind of image in, in Diné life. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's coffee is a big thing on the Navajo Re reservation. Um, and it's kind of been um, like a recurring theme in my, um, my artwork. Um, so a lot of the paintings too as well um and um as a kid that's all i remember were those red folgers coffee cans those big ones so those things just pop up all over and then the little uh coffee cups the blue coffee cups and the um the uh camping um uh, uh coffee pots they would put on the uh the fire stuff like that and boil their coffee um they would do like a cowboy style coffee, basically. They would just put the water and then throw the coffee and then just boil it and drink it like that. So you, when you drink it, you're like spitting out all these little, uh, you know, like pieces of the, uh, you know, the coffee crystals or whatever, the coffee grounds. Yeah, no, I I, I like that about your art. One of, one of these things that I, I, I was noticing is like uh, the, uh, the New Balance, right? The the tennis shoes on the oh, yeah. uh, the sand people. What's uh, what's that about? That was kind of something I threw in there just to kind of uh, symbolize um, kind of my generation. You know, uh, growing up in the eighties, seventies, eighties. I remember always seeing people with those kind of like running shoes. So I thought that would be kind of uh, humorous to throw like like the everybody or everything that's on the uh, Tuscan Raiders or the sand people guys is, you know, um, you know, to form except for their shoes. Cause you don't really see their shoes in the, um, you know, when they're running around, you don't really pay attention to their shoes. So in this one, I have like, kind of like their, their, uh, their robes pulled up a little bit past their ankles. And you can see like one of them's got new balance. The other one has the aces, aces, uh, uh, running shoe. So it's kind of, uh, to me, it's kind of humorous. You know, and also represents, you know, that my, I guess, uh, generation, generation X kind of, uh, you know, when those shoes were kind of cool back in the 80s. Um, and then right. the idea, we kind of joked about this was the idea behind um, the Navajo doing Navajo sand paintings was uh, the medicine man that did the sand painting. He was doing what he was doing was he was healing um, a patient. A patient would have been sick, maybe had cancer or some kind of uh, ailment. And um, so they have like a big ceremony. And one of the ceremonies is a sand painting ceremony. And they did like they did like deities and they did like this whole um, whole, uh, you know, like the world and all this symbolism. And then that's what bring the uh, power from the um, from all over, from all over, from the universe, basically, to help heal this person, so that it would be, that's what they would do, is call on um, all these spirits and power and stuff like that to, to heal this person, uh, so basically, it was like a form of prayer, um, and um, they would do, like, the, they would use the uh, colored sand um, to, to make those symbols on the floor, um, and then in this one, they have uh, R2-D2, uh, so we were uh, kind of joking around uh, to the fact that um, R2-D2 had a virus, you know, like a computer virus. Right. <laughs> so so these, these guys are trying to heal uh, R2-D2 uh, to, to make them well again. Well, so I was going to say, yeah, I'm glad that you, that you explained that because, I mean, the, for folks maybe who don't know about 
the the sand painting. I mean, this is this is sometimes a very sort of uh, important form of of practice in in ceremony. Uh, and so, you know, this is uh, this is sacred work for for many people. Uh, and here you have it depicted in this art form, right? And so, in, in a kind of way, the you're being drawn into seeing things like behind behind the scenes, right? Not only are, are the, the, you know, you're seeing the, the running shoes, but you're seeing uh, an aspect of Diné ceremonial culture being depicted here in this kind of way. Um, uh, is, is there, is, you know, do you run into any time, any problems where people are like, you know, you shouldn't be showing people this aspect of Diné culture, Ryan, or, or is this something that you feel that is important to share with people who may not be Native? Before I did this painting, I had to, well, we, we had the idea and, you know, I was going to do it. And I went and asked several people, um, you know, that knew about Navajo culture, um, and a few of the elders um, that I know that know about like this stuff. Um, and I asked them, would it be um, okay if I did this painting with these characters from Star Wars doing a sand painting in a Hogan? And they said, no, it wouldn't, it would be, it would be fine. Um, just as long as you don't use any of the same symbolism that they use in the ceremony, but everything else is fine. It's, you know, the Hogan is, itself is not as sacred as you know, all the stuff that, you know, that, that goes along with the ceremony and the purpose of the ceremony, as long as you don't use any of that stuff, it's fine. So basically when you look at this, it's just like two sand people sitting in a Hogan, you know what I mean? It has really nothing to do with Navajo culture, unless you're, unless you know you're, you're Navajo, unless you know that the Navajo culture, you understand that, but, um, but I'm not using any of the symbolism, any of the sacred stuff, to go along with that. So there's, you know, so I, so I'm like, all right, I'm going to go ahead and use it then. Uh, and then I was going to say in the, the tapestry that's hanging in the background is uh, the Bantha. Um, that's the, uh, the creature that the uh, sand people ride. Uh, and then there's like the two moons of, uh, or the two suns of uh, um, Tatooine um, kind of setting in the back or coming up like a sunrise or whatever. And then in the right corner is a calendar, um, what's it say, 2019. Um, and then the symbol, I don't know if you know what NTUA is, but NTUA is uh, the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. It's a company that's a tribal uh, company that's basically the electrical electrical power company on the reservation and every year they come out with a uh, with a calendar so every year you see new calendars all over everybody's house from NT. wow so it's kind of like a thing you see in every house. so it's kind of funny to put that in there that's uh, cool right that's one of those like sort of little easter eggs that like you were saying that you might not really know unless you are a uh, native right yeah especially if you're navajo you know what yeah I mean? People, I mean, you know, like people that when I first posted this on my fan page, the Navajos got that right off. You know, oh my God, there's an NTUA calendar in the back. That's hilarious. You know what I mean? <laughs> right on. Wow. Well, you have a second uh, painting that you uh, uh, shared with us, and so let me let me see if I can put that one up. Okay. And uh, and tell us what uh, what this one is about. What's going on here? Uh, basically, this is a. Um, like a split frame kind of a uh, image and it's the same Ewok, um, the same Ewok on the left and the same Ewok on the right. And basically this has to deal with uh, the American Indian boarding school system. This was uh, implemented in um, the 1800s and went all the way up to uh, like 1973, the year I was born. And um, the idea behind this was since the government wasn't able to extinguish all of the Native Americans and Native Americans were put on um, reservation lands and you know kind of were put there they needed to do something with the uh, children and they needed they wanted the uh, Native Americans to assimilate eventually into American culture to sort of like you know make them invisible at some point you know make them not not Native American anymore. So the idea was to put them in school 
strip them of their culture, their language, uh, you know, their long hair, if they had long hair, um, their identity, and teach them how to become American citizens, teach them English, teach them about math, English, uh, you know, history, whatever, whatever they were teaching in public schools at that time, um, like educate them and, and teach them how to be, you know, trades to go into the American working class to be productive citizens and to kind of forget about their indigenous culture. So that was the idea. And when this happened, a lot of this was basically people coming to the reservations and just taking the children from their parents like basically forcibly taking their children out of their parents' homes and forcing them to go to public to boarding schools where they would just stay there for at least a year, you know, sometimes even more and not even see their family. And they were subjected to uh, abuse, uh, physical abuse, uh, emotional abuse, or mental abuse, sometimes even sexual abuse. So there was a lot of hardship from, you know, to the students and to their parents you know it was like both so it was a really uh dark time for um native americans at this at this at this time uh, in history so there's not a lot of good um stuff that came out about this time so it was something that the natives went through um but i think there was a lot of um, tribes some of them that were able to avoid some of these some of some of the uh indigenous tribes were able to make their own schools or some of them were able to have schools on their reservations where they could um, where they could stay home and um, go to school you know so but there was a lot of them they weren't able to do that and a lot of them they didn't have a choice so that was really hard and I and I kind of grew up just um, I just barely kind of missed that boarding school generation and I remember growing up as a kid, um, remembering all these, uh, like my like my generation, understanding that all these other older native people were like kind of like hard asses, you know, like really mean spirited, really angry about everything and a lot of stuff that was going on. And we would just, people would just say, oh yeah, they're boarding school generation. That's boarding school generation. You know, that was kind of one way of kind of trying to understand where they were coming from because they grew up in a harder, harsher um, life. You know, they were they were um, subjected to all this stuff, all this mistreatment, um, you know, stripped of culture and all this stuff. So this painting, uh, I used the Ewoks from Star Wars as an example of an indigenous, um, you know, group of people living on indoor the the moon of indoor you know like you can see in the background he's in the in the forest and he's got like his sort of like his traditional um you know his uh, traditional clothing on with a spear and on the neck on the right um he's uh he's got like the emperor imperial uh, uh imperial uh uh uniform his hair is all cut you know um, straight and it's all like parted to one side in the background and what's kind of funny about this painting is I made the left side like full of like life and uh, green greenery there's like a lot of plant life and then the one on the right there's like this little pot in the back with these really small plants that are all dark that look like they might almost die you know what I mean so there's like these there's like this little symbolism in each of these pieces you know that tells you a lot about what's happening and I wanted to make the contrast you know the compare and contrast with these two images side by side and I got this idea uh, from you know like going through Google looking up images of uh, American Indian uh, you know the boarding school system and they have a lot of these images where they'd have like a, a picture of one native kid on one side where before he was uh, colonized uh, and then then they show him again when he's uh you know, in his like uniform, his school uniform, his hair is all cut and he's all cleaned up, you know. So that was kind of like the idea behind this painting. But I also wanted to use the Star Wars imagery or Star Wars character to kind of reel people in, 
you know, the people that know that Star Wars, like, wow, well, what are these Ewoks doing? You know, it looks like there's two Ewoks. But once, you know, I, I give them the description and they kind of understand the story, they kind of start to uh, hear or see um, the story behind the uh, Indian boarding schools. And maybe they'll learn a little bit about the history that they probably weren't taught in school, you know, in the public school system. And um, I learned about it because, you know, I grew up on the Navajo reservation. So they taught, they taught us about that a lot, you know, but if you go to the Midwest, nobody knows what the hell happened. You know, they think we're all dead. So I think that um, this is a good way of educating people, not only younger people, but older people um, about what happened with natives during this time, how they were subjected to all this mistreatment, abuse, and how the, uh, uh, the government tried to colonize uh, and take away the indigenous culture from them and how it affected them. And I think it still affects people to this day. It probably affects me in so many ways that I can't figure out, you know, that I have to deal with on my own. And um, so I think that just having the education behind me helps me deal with all this stuff, you know? And I think this is one way of being, uh, of making that sort of a, uh, you know, almost a therapeutic moment for me, you know, it's a therapeutic, you know, you know, for my family, my, you know, the, the family, uh, you know, generations of my family that had to deal with this stuff, you know, because I seen, uh, you know, like, you know, them go to school and come back, you know, and, and it's kind of like really, they're uh, kind of really messed them up, you know, and um, yeah, was, that's really heavy. That's really yeah, heavy. Really fortunate to be able to, uh, uh, to, to go to like school in Utah, to experience a certain, uh, you know, like a, a certain life, you know, and uh, be able to come back and then kind of uh, realize that I kind of was lucky, you know, not to go to boarding school and stuff like that. And then, and as I got more educated and realized that it wasn't their fault, you know, that they have all these, these issues or whatever that they don't know how to deal with. And they end up, you know, turning to alcoholism, turning to drugs, or just, you know, like depression and all kinds of different things that they fall into that they can't get out of. And people are always wondering, why are all these natives all fucked up? Why are they all drunks and stuff like that? You know, it's like they've been, they've been, you know, subjected to all these things and it affects all the households. It affects all the generations of children coming up, you know, and um, it affects their relatives, their cousins, their uncles, you know, it's like a whole thing. And it's, it's generational trauma. It's right. uh, brought down from each generation and it affects us. I mean, it probably affects my son in some way, you know? So it's like, I, that's why I teach him, teach him about all this stuff. I talk to him about all this stuff and um, you know, I teach him that it's important to get an education, but I also teach him about this stuff because I know they're not going to teach him this stuff in his school. Right, right. Well, so I, I wonder about uh, the, the work. I mean, I think that this is such a powerful image when you when you when you tell this story, right? One is capturing the history, being able to sort of show, uh, you know, the, the side by side, because I've seen images like this from Indian uh, boarding school uh, histories, right, where they do that with, you know, with young people, you show them side by side like that. Um, and so it's a, an interesting way of, 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 of reminding us of that history. I, I wonder too, whether you think that the way that you depict Navajo Diné life, whether that this can be inspirational for us to think about how native people can envision the future. Because what I mean by that is that in, in, in some of these kinds of ways, right, what you're doing is, Part of what your work does is, you know, as I think you sort of hinted at this is, you know, that uh, for a lot of folk, right, Native American people are people of the past, or right, or they're 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 stuck in, you know, in a history that's way way back when. Part of your stuff is showing how Native themes show up in our visions of the future, right, mm -hmm. and and or, or our imagined futures, right, and that that Native imagery fits in, in another different kind of context. And so I wonder if you might sort of, you know, as we start to wrap up and think about, you know, what we, you know, what your what your work can do, 
Do you think that Native American culture, you know, broadly speaking, or particularly uh, Dinic culture, it has ideas or images or themes that you think can be inspirational for how we can think about the future moving forward? I, I believe so. I think um, eventually we'll get to a point where we're going to have to really think about the environment, the ecological aspect of how we're living. At some point, it's going to come to a head, and we haven't really dealt with it. We have even like we, we're worried about what's next. Um, you know, what's the cool thing? What's the thing that's happening now? What's the big fad? Um, you know, what's you know? We're worried about all these like little things, and we're not we're not looking at the bigger picture of the population growth. We're not we're not worried about pollution. We're not worried about energy. How to how to conserve energy? How to use natural energy? How to you know not pollute the water we live in? You know um, you know endangered species, uh, disease. All these different things are related to the environment and how we protect it. How we we're supposed to take care of it. How we're supposed to preserve it, and how to, we're supposed to respect it. And I think it all goes back to native culture and native culture was built, like I'm speaking just for um, uh, the net culture, like, uh, and I know uh, other, other indigenous cultures are kind of on the same level, but I can't really speak uh, for them, but I'm just talking about Diné culture. It's about, um, they see things as, uh, you know, like respect and beauty, harmony with, the earth with mother earth with father sky there's always supposed to be that um that connection you know we're not we don't we don't own everything here we don't own like the earth we don't own this land we're just here and we're supposed to, and that gives us stuff and we're supposed to give back that's the whole idea and we we have no clue like um, you know, like the American society does not even think like this. The Western society doesn't even think like this. I, mean, I don't even know if the world thinks like this, the rest of the world. But at some point, the ecology, the environment, the whole, um, the earth is going to be the thing that's going to, you know, this is supposed to sustain us. And I think at some point, this indigenous um, lifestyles and cultural, those ways are going to maybe maybe one of the things that will save us at some point, you know, and that's the future, I think, you know, I think at some point, you know, I don't, I don't want to be doomsday, uh, you know, prophecy guy or whatever, you know, but it's, it doesn't look good. It's like you're trying to change everybody's mind and everybody wants to do their own thing. Everybody has their own way of doing things and you can't change people's mind. Look at the election, you know, um, but it's going to come to a head at some point because of just the population growth, um, you know, technology and the way things, you know, the trajectory of everything going on now. And um, there might be a big giant, you know, change that's going to happen. And I think the environmental way, uh, respecting the earth and stuff like that will become part, will be a big part of that. And it's going to be part of that native culture that, you know, that we need to sustain, that's going to be part of our survival, you know, in the future. And I think that's the way that indigenous futurism may be. I'm just, you know, I'm just yeah. speculating, I'm just guessing. But no, that's good. I like that. I like that vision. I mean, uh, um, part of what's important about your work, I think, is that you're showing a way in which that kind of culture can be expressed in new ways. Uh, and for audiences that may not have a background in it, I mean, I think that your your work is like an avenue for a lot of that. Where where would you like your work to go into the future uh, yourself? Uh, what kinds of where do you want to take these these themes of science fiction in your work going ahead? Well, I would like to do at some point maybe like a comic book kind of uh, maybe even a comic book environmental like that indigenous futurism into environmental kind of uh, like a storytelling kind of way, you know, that way anybody could read it. And especially for younger people to kind of, you know, kind of get them thinking in those ways of, you know, in the vi environment, you know, respecting, you know, the earth, conserving things, um, you know, don't be wasteful. Um, you know, there's, 
it has to do with just uh, being conscious of it, you know, understanding what you're, what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. Um, and, um, you know, the, there's like all these different rules, like in the native, in the Navajo culture, um, there's certain things you're not supposed to be wasteful, you're not supposed to do, there's all these things I was taught as a kid, you know, and conserve, you know, be conservative, be, um, um, you like the coffee can, you know what I mean? They didn't throw it, they didn't just throw it away. They used it, you know, after for all kinds of different things, you know what I mean? I'm sure they probably used it until it turned to rust, you know? So it's just like, um, there, I mean, there's these things that, that we were taught as, as, you know, as children that we kind of learned along the way. And I have to, I, I'll, as an adult, I have to also be conscious of that too. I have to be conscious for myself and realize that I need to not waste this, not waste that. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a challenge for myself, but I think that if we can kind of just get that out in the world, um, you know, where people can kind of read it, bond it, um, get educated, get influenced by, maybe they'll start to teach other people, maybe teach their own version of, or pick up on that, you know, and go with it, you know, make their own um, way of, you know, kind of telling their own story about environmentalism or envir environmental consciousness, you know, just all these different things that, I mean, there's, people don't want to die you know what i mean people don't want to die in the future we want to be able to live and sustain a living you know um we want to be able to keep you know multiplying and have you know and you know live as long as we can but it's just like you we don't want to be uh living underground in a bunker you know what i mean uh going around in gas masks it's like i wouldn't see our i, I didn't see america at some point walking around with masks you know what i mean you know, last year, two years ago, I would never saw it going down the street, people with masks on the street. But it's a reality now. I mean, it's like, I don't want to see that 10 years, people wearing gas masks, you know, walking down the streets. So it's like, we need to, at some point, start educating people. And I think that's a lot of the scientists, a lot of environmentalists are kind of working towards that way, but they're getting cock blocked by all the politicians and corporations, you know, that, that have all the money, you know, because they want you know, the fossil fuel, they want the, you know, pharmaceuticals, all these different corporations that make money. They don't see 10 years in the future. They don't see 20 years in the future. They just see, you know, getting, you know, the greed, the ri getting richer, you know? So that's the, that's the reality of the world that we live in, but we need to get our younger people, um, our, um, our youth into thinking like that, because that's going to be their future. You know what I mean? If, if uh, we don't, we don't do something, if they don't, you know, it's like, we got to teach them and they got to teach us, you know, at the same time. So that's kind of like one of the things I would see, I would like to see is like, maybe if I could do like a little comic book that's, you know, presented in a really cool, you know, like a um, attractive way uh, to get people involved with it and really get into it or even, um, even toys, you know what I mean? That'd be kind of cool, you know, characters or whatever. I think, uh, that would be like a Dene kind of thing. That would be awesome. Um, I mean, I, I always have dreams about being in museums and galleries and stuff like that, but I mean, kind of already done that, you know what I mean? But I think that if I could influence younger, you know, younger people into just being creative and then taking it maybe a whole nother level, you know, I think that would be a cool thing, you know, even just doing workshops or, uh, presentations like I did today, um, just kind of get them to think about stuff. Because when I was younger, I didn't have uh, guys coming into my school and talking about art and being the same color, you know, or being from the same, you know, reservation and talking about art and, you know, making me really like, wow, this is cool. You know, it's a, it, I had to kind of just be the one that did it, you know, I had to be the person that I wanted to be you know, or, or wanted to see in my school. So um, I think that that would be one of the things would just be, uh, that's why I want to go into teaching, you know, um, so I could be, be able to influence um, younger generations and to be in creative, being able to use art as sort of a therapeutic um, uh, form of, uh, you know, creativity, and then also being able to use it some way to educate, 
you know, and environmental um, environmentalism is a whole other way of educating. Um, so I think that that's an important thing, you know, and I think that we've steered away from the arts, you know, a lot, you know, um, um, in, in the world, people are too fast paced with everything, you know, like, uh, people will look at things for three seconds or one second or whatever. You don't really pay attention to, you know, everything that's going on. And I think that we need to get back, step back a little bit and kind of appreciate things a little bit um, longer, you know, kind of take in the reality of things, you know. Um, so do you think that that sort of sense of patience is a, um, a Dene characteristic of stepping back and having that greater appreciation? I think so. I think it's just because um, when I was younger, and I think this is a cultural thing that people don't understand why uh, Navajos or natives are uh, quiet, you know, because you'll, you'll go and you'll, you'll, you'll run across Navajos or natives, and a lot of them will be really quiet, but they're really quiet and reserved because they're listening and they're kind of collecting sort of like their thoughts. And it's just like, if you don't have anything important to say you don't really need to speak you know that's kind of like one of the things that i was kind of taught if you don't have anything really important to to uh to input or to give then maybe you shouldn't say anything so that's kind of like one of the things that were um were kind of taught so but also listening too was one of the things that were taught so that you'll see a lot of navos are just kind of like we'll just kind of sit there and quiet but then maybe sometimes they'll say a couple of words and then that's that's their that sums up their whole you know their whole thing you know because um, some people will just talk and they'll just keep talk, talking and it's like what the fuck are you saying it's like, it's like their mouths are moving and it's like there's nothing coming out yeah one person could say one word and it could mean everything you know what i mean so it yeah. just kind of just depends on um, um i think it's like a cultural thing for um, navajos you know because they're kind of more reserved they kind of kind of want to keep their you know their sort of like their comments to themselves but if there's something that they that they, they want to address that's important they'll do it you know so i yeah. think that's a cultural kind of thing that with them you know but yeah i'm kind of i'm, I'm kind of the same way too um, but i mean once you get me talking i'll fucking go forever <laughs> well no i appreciate you talking with us by the way and and sharing your vision about this and 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 letting us know about the important things you have to say um uh, you know, uh, I want to round out our time finally and, and just say, you know, thank you very much for your thoughts. We'll make sure to let people know how to get a hold of you in the comments down below, right? We'll, we'll have a link to some of your work. But I just want to say it's been a pleasure to chat with you and to find out a little bit more about your vision and your work and the influence that you do. And so I want to wish you uh, uh, good luck uh, with some of your projects. And uh, I, I hope that we can continue to talk uh, as your work progresses in this way. So thank you very much. Thank you. I had a good time. Um, it's, it's nice to talk about stuff like this because it gets me more fired up about what I do. So I, I appreciate you asking me to, to come on here and, and speak with you and stuff like that and maybe get some uh, information out there, yeah. educate people and stuff like that. So it's a good thing. Well, thank you. No, I appreciate that. And thank you all for coming by and uh, sitting with us and, and listening to uh, uh, Ryan speak about uh, his work. Uh, if you have any comments, go ahead and leave them down below. We'd love to hear from you and uh, your views, perhaps on indigenous futurisms and ways of expressing uh, culture and art and visions of the future in this kind of way. Uh, if you would like to contact us, you can find us at the NRA's project on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can also find us at our website, which is nrasproject.org. Uh, and let us know what you think. You can also subscribe to uh, our channel here on YouTube. We have lots of different videos in the Trek Wars at OSU channel uh, and lots of other different discussions with uh, organizers and people making change. And so once again, thanks, Ryan Singer. We appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care. Have a good one.